Uh, well, at this point, we will open our first round of questions, and the chair recognizes himself for five minutes. I've heard a variety of concerns about um, the implementation of the GNAP program, so I want to better understand that, and I would like for, uh, I have some questions for Admiral Grossenbacher and Mr. Fry. Uh, first, uh, can either of you provide me with a cost estimate? Are we talking hundreds of millions, billions, or tens of millions of dollars? Um, the report uses tens of billions, although at the time we did the report, we didn't have a really definitive cost estimate. I agree with that. For the long-term implementation of the technology, it's a, it's a significant investment over a long period of time. Okay. Well, that is a very huge uh, investment of taxpayer dollars. And with that understanding, I would like to clarify that the Department aims to, de to deploy commercial-scale facilities at some point to accomplish two main goals, waste reduction and nonproliferation of weapons-grade materials. Uh, has a process for recycling spent fuel that meets that goals? Uh, are the goals I stated been identified? And if so, is it ready for commercial deployment? I think in the committee's view, the short answer to that is uh, not, certainly not ready for commercial deployment. There are several processes that could be examined, and what we recommended was that this department systematically sort through those to determine the one that looks the most promising in light of what else is going on in the world and ultimately that to commercial scale. You concur with that, Admiral? Mr. Chairman, the only thing I want to add is that you said waste, waste reduction. That's true. The other intention is resource utilization, remembering that the current once through fuel cycle only uses a very small percentage of the uranium, the potential, the, the uh, But in terms the of the recycling, the fuel, uh, uh, that process is not ready for commercialization. Is that correct? Would you concur with Mr. Fry's? Not, not as envisioned in GNEP. Certainly, there are recycling technologies that are industrialized today, but not. Well, that's not what as I was trying to get to the GNAP program. Yeah. Okay, Admiral. So, spending billions of taxpayer dollars on commercial scale facilities before the necessary research and development has been uh, conducted, it's a little hard for me to understand. Uh, so. Uh, has it has been reported that the department is moving away from that strategy? Can you confirm that for me? The um, short answer is no. I can't. I, I don't know um, the precise details of the current uh, discussion about GNEP. I I feel I, it's important to remind you that this is is meant to be a development and demonstration program that is evolutionary, and that you have to start somewhere. So but don't you start with research rather than with um, uh, uh, oh, moving sure forward a, a full-scale tens of billions of dollar commercialization? And with all the needs here, I mean, is this, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to, with limited dollars, right. is, this, you know, is this the best way to spend those dollars? And um, is this a focused uh, way? And, uh, you know, quite frankly, there's been concern in many areas that there wasn't a lot of collaboration. Uh, that this doesn't really, it was a sort of everything for everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm concerned, again, if we're going to make this investment, I want to make it in the be best possible way. Yes, sir. I, th I think that's a valid point. The only thing I want to point out is if you look at the goals of GNAP, which uh, from a technology point of view, which are ambitious, the key question is what's the time frame and when do you, uh, when do you go to a full-scale industrial demonstration of that technology and what technology do you choose? And that has to be informed by both an R&D process and the involvement of the industry. You know, the laboratories, the scientists and engineers don't, don't build and operate these large-scale industrial facilities. So I think it's all in the issue is what's the time frame that, that well, you're part of that, about. The issue also is having a, a, a broad enough buy-in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, that you can keep a flow of taxpayer dollars going uh, to, um, uh, to feel comfortable with this. So this real, real quickly, uh, Dr. Cochran or, or Mr. Fry, would you want, you want to comment on this issue? In Only to say that uh, in our report, we said, while we don't see 
the virtue in spending a lot of money right now for big commercial facilities. It's a long-term program. Kind of the quid pro quo is it is a long-term program, and therefore sustained commitment and sustained funding is really important to the success of that program. And that kind of stability is not something that the nuclear R&D budget has experienced over the last several years. And it's something that uh, I, I hope that the Congress will be able to sustain at a reasonable level over a long enough period of time with the appropriate outside advice so that they can get the job done. Quickly, what is the appropriate outside advice? Um, and who would that be? Or, we no, not what is it, but, but, but who, well, who's the vehicle well, we, for that? We recommended that the Department set up an outside advisory committee that's independent, objective, and has a strategic focus. What we have in mind, to put it in an analogy that may be familiar to you, or something like the um, science advisory committees at the Department of Energy, okay. which, we, which we, has a, which is composed of people of the community, but as you know, they're perfectly willing to tell the department when they're wrong. Yeah. And that's what is yeah, I think that's important. I, I don't want to abuse my time. And I, I know uh, Mr. Cochran is probably uh, squirming in his seat, so why don't you um, um, have a closing statement on this topic? Mr. Chairman, uh, the GNAP program is doomed to failure. The vision requires that roughly for every 100 gigawatts of thermal reactor capacity, the type of reactors we have today, you would need roughly 40 to 75 gigawatts of fast reactor capacity. And fast reactors have been under development under development in this country and around the world since 1946. The programs to develop fast breeder reactors were failures in the United States, in France, in the United Kingdom, in Germany, in Italy, in Japan, and I would also argue in Russia. The flagships of these programs were all failures. Manju, had an accident, was shut down in 95 and hadn't restarted. Super Phoenix in France had a lifetime capacity factor of between 6 and 7 percent. The Clinch River reactor was canceled. We've left the FFTF sitting around in the state of Washington and folded that program back into the e very small EBR-1 reactor, uh, EBR-2 reactor at Idaho. The German reactor was canceled before it was fueled, and it's been turned into an, a, a, a hotel and amusement park, and is probably the only fast reactor that has ever made money. <laughs> the British fast reactor program was canceled. The Italian ones never got off the ground. The Russians never put plutonium in their fast reactor. Well, Mr. Mr. Cocker, I don't want to abuse my time. I, I think the, the, the short answer there is that clearly this needs to be rethought uh, to make sure that we are, uh, with this past history, that but we are spending uh, one, those limited dollars. One so more wisely. point. Okay. Because this program is doomed to failure, because these programs are unreliable, I, I didn't mention, by the way, it was a failure in two navies, the United States Navy. Admiral Rick over jerked it out of the Sea Wolf and in the Soviet Navy. But what is going to happen is the R&D is going to go forward, and the U Department of Energy is promoting this R&D not only in weapon states but in non-weapon states. And what we are doing is training people in actinide chemistry and plutonium metallurgy, and the proliferation risks are going to increase from the R&D programs, and they will never decrease from the deployment of the program. Uh, th thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Bilbrey is recognized for five minutes.